Good morning, everybody. So, yesterday in my last lecture, I talked of thin films and all of that. And then now we are moving over from powders to finished materials. Thin films was the first starting point, but now we are going to take up real issues. For example, the cup from which you drink your coffee or tea or any beverage, how is it made? It has clay, uh, depending on the cost of the cup, there will be china clay. with ball clay, there will be feldspar and there will be quartz or sand among the additives. So, these are the principal ones though other additives are also added which I will come to now. What is done the china clay, ball clay, feldspar, the quartz or the sand they are ground to a fine powder and then they are shaped in the form of a cup. Here the clay especially the china clay it has got flat plate like structures very thin each of the platelets if I look at it is this the thickness is 10 angstroms or somewhere there about they are 100 angstrom apart and this itself helps in ensuring that once the cup has been shaped it stays that way. For example, the earthenware pots from which you drink tea at railway stations. It is again made from clay though hardly they will take the clay shape it and when it dries it retains its shape. But for example, take the your students. So, let me take the case of ordinary chalk, the chalk which your teacher uses in class. It has calcium carbonate powder mixed with some gum and then rolled into the shape of a chalk. This gum is the binder. Now, a lot of you have seen chalk which give off plenty of dust when it is written on the board and also the so called dustless chalk. Both of them have calcium carbonate. So, why is one chalk dustless while the other chalk gives off plenty of dust? It is simply the type of binder that is used. Let me take a third example. Most all of you, all of us have headaches. Uh, one of the cheapest drugs that we take is either crocine or calpol or dispirin. For those of you who have tried to break a crocine tablet, it is pretty strong. But the dispirin is much more easier to break. The dispirin just you put it in water, it effervesces and dissolves while the crocine would not. So, obviously, there is a fundamental difference between the calpol and the crocine content. 
But one thing is common that is if you are taking say a crocine which has got 250 milligrams of the active ingredient obviously the 250 milligram is not the entire tablet it is mixed with an inert material like calcium carbonate and then it is some binder is added and then the material is pressed to give you the tablet. This binder ensures that the calcium carbonate containing the crocine or the active ingredient does not fall apart. In dispirine, similar thing is there with a little bit of difference. Firstly, I told you that you take the dispirine and put it in water, it effervesces. So, here obviously the binder is such that it dissolves in water very easily so that the tablet comes apart and can dissolve in the water. So, first of all the particles are much more finer, the binder molecule molecular wave molecular length is shorter due to which the uh, uh, dispirine just dissolves. The effervescence is due to some other ad addition and it varies. So, in all these cases we use binders to give a definite shape. So, I have to take the powder, mix some binder with it and then, then that binder holds the powders together. Let us take uh, look at how ceramic say the Calpol tablet, uh, they, they are pressed, they come in different shapes, some come in this shape, some come in this shape. For simplicity's sake, let me tick off with this one. What would I do? One way the calcium carbonate, which is the basically the body, add appropriate amount of the active ingredient three years mix so that mixture is as homogeneous as possible. Is as homogeneous as possible. Then four add the binder mix physically after mixing we now have a powder with the base the calcium carbonate with the active ingredient dispersed throughout the powder and the binder. Now, how would we go on making the pellet if you ask me? Uh, let me take one pellet at a time. I would have a stainless steel die, very thick walled. Then I 
what would I do is um, this is called the bottom plug I would fill this space with this mixture and then a top ram comes in. The whole thing is placed on a fixed platform. Now realize I have done a very interesting thing. This bottom plug, this is called the die, this is called the hammer and the bottom plug is called the anvil. The way I place this material is not how normally people will place. Normally people take this is the support, this is the die wall, they place the anvil over here, the powder and then the hammer from the top. This is what people use normally. But what I have done is over here the anvil is sitting on top of the fixed platform. Whereas here both the anvil and the die is sitting on the fixed platform means this is the effective area of the bottom plug. Here the effective area is only this which means that the force per unit area is much more higher than here. There is another reason why if I am using this and then pressing what would happen this would come down the hammer would come down here, but during this process let me see what happens to the powder. Let us presume there is a powder layer uncompressed. This is the die wall. Let us presume that this end is blocked, I put in the powder and I am putting in a hammer from the top. In this particular one, this top surface, the pressure difference would be some love somewhat like this because the powders would tend to tick to the die walls while the center powders will tend to move down. At this end this is a force from the top at this end there would be reaction force. So again the pressure line due to the reaction force due to this bottom hammer bottom anvil would be something like this. But then please realize that this is a die wall the anvil the area at the bottom is this much which is much smaller than the area over here for the hammer and hence if I calculate the force per unit area it is much lower at the bottom than at the top and in that case I will have 
non uniform distribution of pressure at the top the hammer is coming down the area is smaller than the bottom so force per unit area is high so this would be the iso pressure lines as the hammer is coming down but here because the area is large the is iso pressure lines are also flatter hence if we have made a ta a tablet from this what i would see is there is a huge pressure difference between the different dimensions of the pellet which means packing would not be uniform in this particular one the a this area is equal to this area hence in this powder which i am compacting the pressure lines are or absolutely identical this will have a much more homogeneous compact than this one this is called uniaxial pressing simply because i really we are putting a lot of pressure on one side and the other one the bottom is just merely acting as a plug to see that the, the whatever is been pressed does not fall down so if i really want to have a ceramic powder which has got uniform compaction everywhere i would go to this particular technique this is called biaxial pressing why because this powder is being pressed from both the sides okay i have taken the powder i have added the binder now what is the effect of a badly chosen binder on making say a calpol tablet let me go back to the diagram which i had drawn over there okay still by axial and this is the hammer what will happen there will be oh, this supported on a platform so i will have uniform pressure gradient on both the top and the bottom as a result of which the mechanical stability of the pellet generated by this particular process let's say this will become finally a calpol tablet this one will be much higher than if i had done uniaxial pressing because uniaxial pressing i have said the powder size varies face to face and with time also so here we have used biaxial pressing ha huh. so in this biaxial pressing we get uniform 
uniform compacts but will this help prevent the powders in compact from uh, breaking up. Why should we be break up? A, there has been so much of pressure applied to make this pellet. The, most of that pressure has been retained in the form of energy inside the pellet itself. So, unless I have got a binder which will hold all the grains, it is pointless to go on. So, here what we add are also certain binders. So, that after pressing which we got over here the binders are evenly distributed inside the sample. Now, you may have a question as to how uh, I said it is housed in a polymeric container. How would the binders be taken out or what prevents the binder from sticking to the side walls of the small containment vessel? Uh, the reason the, what, that that would be done by uh, by using say stearic acid, we take a small amount of stearic acid, prepare a one percent solution, and then apply to all the inner surface of this particular material. What does the stearic acid do? It allows slipping. Stearic acid is one of the components of your cheap soaps. It allows slipping. So, what happens? This anvil can move up and hence we get a ceramic pellet which does not have any size distortion or rather rather I would say does not have a case against him. But even then you have taken the powder you have pressed it under this is called isostatic pressing where pre or the biaxial pressing isostatic is something I will come a little, little bit later and when the whole am hammer and anvil withdraw is withdrawn will this spout compact retain its shape the answer is usually no you have to add certain binders which will flow between the grains of the compacts and give the strain. Uh, binders come in many shapes, sizes or well molecular weights. Let me go over the types of binders that are used. If I am looking at organic binders, we have um, microcrystalline um, micro crystalline cellulose. This is one organic binder long chain and that helps and that also creates problems at some, some, some time. Now, if you look at molecular type uh, 
uh, we have got organic gums. Example, if you ask for it, I will have xanthine gum. Uh, xanthan gums, then what you can have is gum arabic, you can have this is a natural one, it is extracted from natural sources. We have got polysaccharides. We have got polysaccharides which is basically refined starch. Then for the paper industry, we have got lignin extracts. We have got lignin extracts. Uh, people who require lot of algerant. And uh, what would I write? Cellulosic ethers. These are derived from methyl cellulose. So, here on, in the under organic we have a lot of binders under inorganic we have soluble silicates uh, soluble silicates like say sodium silicate what else will I put organic silicates phosphates are also added but now they are being banned under Montreal protocol. Uh, even soluble aluminates. Mm -hmm. All right. These are the inorganic ones. Now, I talked of here of organic ones which are natural. I talked of inorganic ones which are natural or synthetic. Among the organic synthetic ones, we have polymerized alcohol. which is for an example is PVA polyvinyl alcohol, I will come to this details later. Then we have got polyvinyl butyral, we have got polymethyl methacrylate <coughs> I'll mark them because late a bit later I shall come back to these two polyethylene glycol uh,
I have already talked of uh, the natural ones over here. In addition, what we can also have is polyethylene glycol, we can have paraffin, microcrystalline wax. which helps in binding. <coughs> now, let me go back to this particular diagram. The hammer has been pressed, it has been brought down to this thickness. What and this is the final Uh, what would I say? The shape beyond which the powder cannot be compacted. Now, we have a problem. We have to take this pellet out. Now, let us imagine a couple of situations. Hmm. This is the pressed pellet with the other impurities being on the surface. The vacuum or the pressure in this whole thing is broken and now if I try to take the pellet out through here, what will happen? what would happen is, first of all, when the pressed pellet is right at the top, the distribution of pressure or force is uniform. Uh, how do I explain it? Okay. As it tries to come out, while it, no, while it is inside this, the pressure distribution is normal. But then, when the pellet tries to come, we try to push the pellet out of here, over here, this pressure with all the pressure with which it has been pressurized, it would tend to be released. So, what would happen? the ends would start buckling to relieve the extra pressure and as a result these crack. This is called end capping. This end capping can be due to a lot of things. One is the whole pellet has been pressed to very high pressures inside the die there is no avenue for the pellet to release the pressure. So, when I try to take the pellet out of the die, what would happen is as the powder as the compact comes out, slowly the pressure they would it would want the pressure to be relieved. So, this length will increase and end capping will occur. Is the pressure release the only factor why end capping occurs? The answer is no, because the polymer the binder, the china clay mixture, the feldspar, the polymer have been mixed very well. So, what happens over here? As the pellet starts coming out, it finds an unbalanced load because there is no restraining wall over here just as you used to do over here. And as the pellet comes out of the hmm. 
Hmm. What would I do? It would break up. This end capping would occur. Why does this occur? The simple reason is binder choice. If the situation is such that this is the pressure, this is the length. So, as the if this is the pressure increased, this the pressure is increased more, this becomes this, and as the pressure is increased still more, it becomes this. But when we release the pressure, if the binder is very hard. What would happen? The internal stresses would be very high and the whole thing would fracture, which is why this end capping occurs. Hence, we have to choose a binder whose glass transition temperature is near room temperature, so that when we press it, binder flows, withdraw pressure, binder hardens this does not happen very easily this should not happen as I apply the pressure the binder flows and I withdraw the pressure the binder immediately hardens this would cause lot of internal stresses. So, what is done is along with the binder a material is added which modifies the binder that is if I got long chain binders the binder modifiers they simply break it up to short chains. short chains. This allows or this avoids the spring back. Spring back is this as it is come out of the die the whole pressure is released and it breaks this is called the spring back. So, the ideal thing would be to choose a binder with a proper molecular weight which has got a glass transition temperature at or near room temperature. Having said this, said the type of binders that are needed, the effect of glass transition temperature on the binder or on the system I have also talked of. Now, let us look at certain binders. I have already said clay is binder itself. Is binder itself. Other than clay what do we have? We have got molecular binders. we have got molecular binders. <coughs> These 
these are anionic binders. Then we have the cationic binders. And finally, we have the non-ionic. <coughs> These binders are the different types of among the in the ceramic systems these are the binders which are normally used mostly we are bothered with uh, non ionic or slightly anionic binders because they have to be adsorbed on the surface of ceramics to act as binders. Let us take the case of polyvinyl alcohol. A very common binder in ceramic systems. A very, very common binder in ceramic system. Uh, the way it looks like is and so on. This is a very common ceramic binder in ceramic systems. This is fully hydrolyzed, fully hydrolyzed and this OH groups the C double bond O groups, they adhere to the surface of ceramic particles and cause the binding action. The other types of vinyl binders are let us say poly vinyl acetate. This is a very commonly available material and its end group is another binder polyacrylamide. polyvinyl butyral or PVB Ha huh. no no it will be
polyvinyl butyrol. This is a non ionic binder. This is a non ionic binder. Another non ionic binder is PMMA poly methyl methactridate. This is also a non ionic binder. As I had said, cellulose is used as a binder in some cases. And cellulose, whose structure is something like this, I hope I do not make a mistake. Yeah, this is cellulose as a binder, correct diagram. Now, in this case, cellulose is a water soluble binder. Now, all of these binders are normally water soluble, they can be ionic or non ionic. How does the molecular weight affect binding property. I had already stated that the th that the T G or glass transition temperature depends on the molecular weight. With large molecular weight materials, the T g is higher. With cross link molecular weight materials, the T g is higher. If the higher, if the T g is higher, one of the biggest problems that we will have is if we are pelletizing and then trying to make a pellet. I may have a spring back. So, molecular weight control is very important and at times plasticizers are added to break long molecular weight uh, polymers into smaller ones, so that the temperature can be controlled. Another fact that this binder is 
the type of binders is at times the gelation if we are doing not just pressing, but we are creating a suspension from which a certain body will be developed. The gelation rate is affected depending on the binder particle by depending on the, depending on the binder sizes. Uh, just a simple diagram will tell you how it affects. This is the viscosity, temperature and uh, I am talking of a 2 percent methyl cellulose solution. You see, I am increasing it, heating it and then cooling it. I get a hysteresis loop. I simply do not have this, then it goes back. I have a hysteresis loop. Now, in ceramic processing, the existence of hysteresis loop does at times cause severe problems. And methyl cellulose and such binders may, may, may not be the best of the binders for every occasion. The other problem with the binders is this that since they adsorb on the surface of the ceramic particles and if we are using not pelletization, but suspension to form a shape, uh, we may have problems with flocculation because these binders will stick to the surface and will modify the flocculation behavior of the basic suspension. So, the amount and the type of binders which are used in suspension systems has to be controlled very much. Now, the thing is there are binders which if allowed to stand with time, the suspension simply thickens because the binder starts absorbing lot many ceramic molecules ceramic molecules and slowly the system becomes very rigid whether it is a desirable system for the particular operation or not that depends on what your end use is in many cases even polymeric resins are used as binders like say in refractory magnesium carbonate magnesium refractories magnesia is very difficult to center melting point is 2800 degree centigrade so sintering temperature has to be near 2400 or 2200 so what is done is the magnesia grains are mixed with polymeric resins shaped to a particular size and then fired or used in the refractory. So, polymeric resins are also used as binders. In the next class, what I shall start off from is reaction bonding by helping with binders. And that is where the advantage of certain binders are where a particular binder molecule can at, at, can at, attach to two three or four ceramic grains and when fired they simply give us 
a good dense body. That is reaction bonding and I shall take it up in next class. Thank you.